uh, Create Bets School of the Art Institute of Chicago. And to my right is Moki Tantuko from yeah. the National Veterans Art Museum. And we, uh, we're going to be the uh, myth busters today. Uh, we're going to uh, dispel uh, myths and uh, kind of break down the session uh, in terms of language, programs, etc. cetera. Uh, but basically, it's everything you wanted to know about working with veterans, but we're, we're afraid to touch and, and see. Uh, so the first thing we're going to do is uh, we're going to have uh, Joseph and Moki uh, talk a little bit about their programs. Then we're going to move into a uh, discussion, and then we'll move into uh, some Q&A. So Joseph. Sure, yeah. So I'm the local coordinator and instructor for, instructor for Creative Vets. And uh, it's a nonprofit that partners with the School of the Art Institute of Chicago to bring veterans who have served in, in conflicts overseas, specifically U.S. conflicts, um, to the Art Institute for three weeks as, um, as students. So what's really interesting about the program is that it's not specifically, I think this is something we're going to talk about is, deconstructing the title of art therapies versus uh, veterans using art and what that means for who they are as individuals, but then also the broader, um, I think the, the broader landscape of, of what it means to, to serve overseas and to, um, um, to enforce foreign policy decisions that many of us have a hand in, um, in deciding and, and making through voting and civic engagement. So Creative Vets is under the um, Adult Continuing Education Office of SAIC. The founder was a Marine in Iraq back in 2006. And uh, after he got out, he, he went to art school and found that the, the ability to express himself through the arts was really vital and foundational to understanding a lot of the questions he had about his identity and, and his service over there. And when he realized that that really helped him, he thought that it would be vital to make that resource available to, to other people that he knew and other people that were in, in similar circumstances. So he worked with the Office of Engagement. Paul Coffey, some of you may know, was instrumental in, in helping the program get started as far as the administrative side and, and um, administering that program. And they, they started it in 2015 was the first class. And they had several veterans from, one from Vietnam, from the Vietnam War, and several from Iraq and Afghanistan that, that came to the program. So they were immersed in three weeks of arts instruction that included ceramics and photography primarily, but we also allow students to explore any mediums that the school offers. Because as many of us know, when it comes to the arts, there's no one way to do things. So what we do is we try to be there for them and, and guide them through their creative process. So some of them have a background in the arts, uh, like I did when I came to the program in 2016. Others have never done any type of art, um, whether therapy or just art practice otherwise. So um, as I said, I went through in 2016 as a participant. I found out about it two weeks before the, the class was set to start, and uh, I heard like, okay, free trip to Chicago where they cover all my expenses, and I can go to the Art Institute and, and, and get three weeks of instruction. So I think that that's something I want to do. And it really pushed me to, to explore what it meant to be an artist, but then also how I wanted to convey my experiences to, to people that I, I, I was not familiar with. Um, and what I mean by that is, is for, for many veterans, integrating back into society after their time in service, there's a disconnect that can happen between who, they're, who they served and, and the communities they return to. Because a lot of times they have a new identity that we can talk about a little bit later. Um, so for me, it was like, if I'm going to, to delve into this art making and art creation, what does that mean for me and what do I want to communicate to other people? Um, and, and the program was vital in, in, in guiding me through that process. So that is what Creative Vets is about. As I said, I went through in 2016. I returned as a volunteer the next year. And then uh, after my time in the class, I was, 
I was encouraged and motivated to apply to the school itself in arts administration and, and, um, and policy. They have a master's degree program there. I had finished my bachelor's and I thought that um, what the program did for me was, was realize that these resources and this culture, specifically contemporary arts, that is accessible to someone like me. Um, and the recognition that that was something that was accessible was, was something I had never considered before. Um, I was going to go into law enforcement. My, my undergraduate degree was in criminal justice and I had kind of my career path all planned out. Now there were some, some instances in our family that changed the trajectory of where I was going to go professionally and part of it was the Creative Ed's program. So uh, I started school at SAIC last year and worked with the Office of Engagement to coordinate and, and facilitate the program for the following summer and the new group of veterans that we're going to go through. Uh, this year I, I stepped into the role as instructor for the program as well and um, that's something that, that Creative Edge tries to encourage to have peer-to-peer -peer support. So somebody that had, has served overseas in the military, is also invested in the arts, but then also has the, the foresight to be able to, to question their experiences and, and have the maturity to guide other people through that same process. So that's where I'm at right now, and uh, I should be graduating on time next spring and probably be teaching at least one other class of, of veterans. Uh, one thing that's really neat about the program, we have all eras of service, so we've had Vietnam, uh, we've had Beirut and uh, Somalia, um, pretty much any conflict that the United States has been involved in since the 60s, we've had someone representing their time in service there. So um, that's a, a valuable thing because the conflicts are different, but many of the experiences are very similar in spite of the age and, and, and um, the age difference mm -hmm. of the participants. So Great. One quick question. How do, how do uh, people find out about the program? Yeah, so you could always talk to me afterwards if you'd like. Um, also, creativevets.org is the website, and uh, I believe it's on the programs there. So if you go to the program, there is uh, an art program, which is what I am involved with, and then there's also a songwriting program that is part of the broader organization. And they partner with, ten um, with, uh, with songwriters in, in Nashville and Tennessee. So they have like a monthly program where they be bring veterans to Nashville they have a three-day writing session with them where they get to work with uh, Nashville's top songwriters. They really try and recruit and, and work with those people. And then they record a song so, uh, cool. for the veteran. So that, that's run out of Nashville. Mm -hmm. um, the art program is primarily in Chicago. That's like the flagship location for, for the arts and creative. Events. Great. Moki? Hi, everyone. I'm Moki Tantoko. I am from the National <laughs> Veterans Art Museum. Um, we are located in Portage Park, which is on the northwest side of the city of Chicago, um, right at the um, Six Corners. Uh, da -da. So uh, I'm the Education and Programs Manager. I actually started there as the Assistant Education Coordinator after graduating from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, where I received my K-12 through visual arts licensure. So I am a licensed arts educator, and I actually am able to use that in both my writing of curriculum that is based off of the current exhibitions in the National Veterans Art Museum, but also have taught um, an After School Matters program, our teen council, um, through at the museum where they learn small museum administration, but also meet with veteran art or artists and respond to the artwork that they are seeing, um, as well as teaching alternative night school program um, in the suburbs where I actually went to high school too. So I just wanted to put out there um, um, one of my favorite pieces at the National Veterans Art Museum. So we exhibit artwork that is created by military veterans um, at the museum too. I think as we're gonna be talking about sort of what is the language that we use around not only military culture, but our veteran community. At the museum, we believe that everyone that has had military service, doesn't matter how long, doesn't matter what their discharge was, doesn't matter if they served overseas in combat, right, um, or just stayed stateside is a veteran. So we represent those voices um, through artwork created by them. And so this is uh, a piece called Falling Airmen that was um, created by Leo McStravick, who is a, a US uh, 
in the US Navy, he was a sailor in Vietnam. Um, and just a quote from him about this artwork. Um, so I can read it. My squadron made it through the war unscathed, but one of our sister squadrons lost two crews of 12 men, each within one month at night over the water from missile fire. Only small bits of debris were ever found. I've often wondered if they were conscious during their fall into the sea. Were they reaching for the water to soothe their burning bodies? No one knows if they had parachutes on, um, but I always saw them with chutes streaming behind them, changing into futile wings that could not support or save them. We, we the survivors, have as our highest obligation the remembrance of our colleagues. Um, one, I think the work is beautiful too, but um, uh, this piece in particular was one of the pieces that I, I give tours at the museum to where I actually had a very young high school student sort of sit in front of it and was doing observational drawings, but then she started having a very intense uh, emotional reaction to the piece. And this was pre-reading the statement that uh, Mick Stravick had wrote. Um, and then for me, that was a big moment in terms of thinking about um, what the museum's mission is, which is to talk about the impact of war experience not only on our veteran community, the people that have experienced it, but also the experience that war has on us, right? I, I'm a civilian, I don't have any military service. I'm the daughter of immigrants, I don't know. I, pre-working at the museum, didn't know, I think, anyone that was a veteran. Um, to my knowledge, though, I have turned out that most people, most veterans, are not wearing caps that tell you <laughs> that they are, right? Um, um, it could be teachers, it could be friends, right? constantly surprised about the amount of military service members there are um, in the community around me that I meet. So for me, watching this young person have this emotional reaction and then talking to her and finding out that, right, um, that uh, her father has military experience and some, like realizing that she actually has never talked to him about his combat experience either. So like this moment, watching this young person like have this engagement with this work kind of like clicked with me like, yes, this museum our mission, <laughs> this is what we're here to do. Um, our current exhibition is Original Warrior. It just opened in the beginning of October. Um, it's an exhibition of artwork created by Native American veterans and Native American artists. Uh, I think this is a really a perfect timing to have this as no November is coming up, which is actually Native American Heritage Month, and not only that, but also Veterans Day. Um, and then this year is actually the 100th anniversary, right, of uh, the end of World War I. So our Mrs. Day. Um, uh, these are just some pieces from the exhibition and our, you can see sort of our museum space which includes its installation, its photographs. Um, we collect artwork from veterans of all wars and conflicts um, but very heavily focused on Vietnam because we were founded by a group of Vietnam veteran artists uh, that had an exhibition in the 80s and it was called Reflexes and Reflections and this was the first time that um, sort of a, a large statement about the experience of Vietnam veterans was well, well received by both the veteran community and the civilian community alike, and this was in Chicago. Um, and some of them were practicing artists, some of them were at the Academy of Art um, downtown, um, some of them were just making it just because, right, it was sort of like ragtag group that came together and had this exhibition that um, started a collection of work. Um, talking about programs, so, I run the programs at our museum, and uh, we call that creative community. Um, they are a range of programs that are veteran artist workshops, um, teaching artist workshops, uh, youth-led workshops, uh, drop-in continuing programs, responsive work related to whatever uh, exhibitions up. This is just a sample of uh, a workshop that was open to the public. Uh, we don't limit our programs to being to a certain age group. So I'm a big advocate for intergenerational experiences for both veterans to be with civilians, but like, um, like Vietnam veterans to be with very young children in this museum space, doing this work together, engaging with the artwork together. Um, Mel L, who is a US Marine Corps veteran um, and a DJ and MC and educator activist, uh, was doing a workshop in our museum space. This is on the floor um, to sort of build up your core to talk about <laughs> voice and presentation and so there's nothing cool about uh, there's nothing cooler than like letting people like play I think in a museum space where I, I feel like it can be very 
you know, white wall, sterile, like don't touch, look, but what we're, as a small museum, we're big advocates for allowing people to have these very interactive experiences in here. Oh, that was perfect. So Joseph, I met Joseph because Creative Vets had an exhibition of their work in 2016 for the first time at the museum, and I saw Joseph perform um, with his work that was there, and um, we became very good friends, thusly. And uh, uh, one of the programs that we just actually received a very large grant from the Illinois Department of Veterans Affairs for is called the Arts Instruction and Mentorship Program, or AIM program. Um, the idea of the program is to have veterans that are interested in education, specifically in the arts, but interested in being in educational spaces, not necessarily in public school, right, um, or like formal organizations, but to give them an opportunity to have professional development training, to work directly with young people um, and in both schools and also like after school organizations and uh, talk about their practice um, through the experience of, of being a veteran artist. Um, so this is a photo of Joseph was very kind to come to our uh, teen program that is actually located at Carl Schur's High School in Chicago, which is just down the street from the museum, and did a, um, just sort of a visitation with them to look at the artwork that they were making in the program. Um, but then also we went out to the hallway and did a drawing exercise and sound exercise workshop. Um, rhythm and, yeah, yes. rhythm and drawing. And Perfect. cognition, all, all that. All that stuff. And it was, I mean, for the, these group of students, um, uh, most of them are, have never taken an art class. Even though there's arts provided in their high school, a lot of them are freshmen and sophomores, and they're not, they can't take that elective until later. Um, so this is a <laughs> very introductory. And I was like, this is a practicing artist. And they're like, yeah, really? And I'm like, yes. <laughs> and he's also a veteran. So. I said really, too. <laughs> yeah, really? Yeah. So um, they, they enjoyed it. Um, but so we started this, uh, we're starting off with this program, doing sort of a pilot run for this year, starting. Um, this year until next year, it goes into the summer, and um, hopefully from there it will become a sustainable program because uh, I haven't worked in the museum for a little over four years. My, and as a civilian, um, I'm very concerned with um, the issue of reintegration, which is veterans returning into civilian life. And what does that mean for me as an administrator to like facilitate programs and events that are educational and like giving those resources, but also as a civilian, how do I share with other civilians that we can participate much deeper than being sort of thank you for your service and putting that out there. Um, I did want to share, this is uh, very exciting because uh, this is uh, their newest acquisition to the collection at the museum. Um, this is a 350-pound <laughs> panel of um, ceramic shields, or ceramic plates that go inside um, vests uh, that was painted by uh, Sean Ganther, who is a US Air Force veteran and an artist. And the project itself is called Lionhearted. Um, these are 22 ceramic um, plates that have portraits of um, mostly Iraq and Afghanistan combat veterans uh, painted by Sean um, in front of, in sort of in front of them as they were sharing their stories. But this is going to be uh, coupled with a film that they did of all the interviews. And so um, Sean decided that he wanted this work to exist at the museum and it will be on display basically indefinitely once we put it up, mostly because it's heavy, but also because um, this is like a, a incredible example of um, work that, that we want to collect, that, that we exhibit and preserve, which is made by a veteran artist that exhibiting stories about veterans artists, or veteran artists and, um, or non, and just sort of preserving those stories. And there's, um, a uh, statistic in which 22 veterans uh, commit suicide daily. And so each, each shield represents one veteran that commits suicide daily. But for me, this piece is kind of incredible because if here's 22 stories of, of veterans, right? So every day you lose 22 of all those stories that are just gone now. So the idea of this project is that 
by sharing this openly with people that like maybe someone would be able to see this and realize like, oh, this person has a very similar experience to me, right? Like this is what they did, right, to keep themselves going. And so yeah. it's very cool, very excited. It's opening November 8th. Um, and then lastly, uh, next year marks a very um, important date for us because we are having the first ever um, Veteran Art Summit in Chicago. Um, the Veteran Art Movement has been growing, so kind of think always been around, right? As long as artists have been coming out of war. I think one of the first things I saw at the National Veterans Art Museum was surrealism in war, and it clicked with me. I was like, oh yeah, all those surreal artists, surrealist artists, they're all, they were all combat vets, right? And it kind of makes sense why their artwork looks the way they, it does, right? So um, May of next year, we will be having artwork throughout the city of Chicago, and then a Veteran Arts, Artist Summit um, highlighting work of co contemporary veterans that are making work in Chicago, but nationally as well, so. Great. So we start out by saying that we were going to uh, demystify and break down what it means to work with veterans. And we thought the uh, first place we could start with was uh, the language used around uh, these kinds of programs and initiatives. And so I was gonna ask Joseph uh, to break down the title of this session for me, <laughs> which is Creative Arts Therapies for Veterans and Service Members. Oh, well, um, I guess it, what, what does the word therapy mean, honestly, in, in this context? That's probably where I would start, like, um, because how you use that language, I think, sets the tone for the conversation in general. And, and I think that, that something that Moki and I have talked about and discussed is that the, the idea of reintegration, like uh, reintegrating, and it's an abstract concept, it can be, but it's, it, it's vital and it's important. And I think that there's so much to unpack with that, um, that, that the word therapy, like, you know, there's clinical definitions of what therapy is. And then there's also, um, you know, you talk to a veteran that, that may have done art therapy, like actual art therapy, at a VA hospital or, or VA outpatient clinic. And that's specific, it has, um, it has evidence-based, you know, research behind it, that kind of stuff. Um, but then you have broader stuff like creative vets. Um, is not, it's not strictly art therapy. It's like teaching veterans how to use these tools that, that probably will help them in some regard. It helped me immensely. Um, I got into performance because of that particular program, because I had never considered it before. But when I had a venue and I had an opportunity to to explore what it meant to perform with my body and who I was as a person. That really made a difference. Um, and so it was very therapeutic to me, but it wasn't strictly art therapy. Mm -hmm. So I think along with the term veteran and therapy, those two often uh, are put in the same context or sentence, but with any type of, of demographic or subculture, as you know, there are um, layers upon layers of experience and also how people do what they do. So that, that's my perspective on, on, on the title and the, the word therapy and the word therapy. And, and both of you work in programs that are therapeutic, but you're not therapists. Yeah. No, I am no, not. Not therapist. <laughs> no, I am not. Do you want to add to Yeah, uh, I mean, so I'm an arts educator, not licensed art therapist, so the programs that I'm running are not therapy programs, I think as both practicing artists and both from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, right? Like art is inherently, right? Art is inherently therapeutic, right? I was in a session the other, yesterday, where we got to like cross stitch and I was like, I could do this all day. I feel super good, right? Like making feels good, mm -hmm. but also I think as a museum, museum professional, right? And doing these tours and having people look at this work, looking at artwork and engaging with visual culture is also therapeutic, right? Mm -hmm. But um, I think it could, it depends on the focus also honestly, because when we hear the word, like art therapy in, in the, con and I'm only speaking from my experience as a veteran, so when I hear art therapy and veteran put together, what I, what I think of is um, individual practices or individual tools for the individual veteran, which um, are necessary and needed and helpful and, and I think have been part of, of 
military culture in whatever form that has taken just over the years in, in the human experience, never mind just the United States, but what it means to be human mm -hmm. and to be a human that is, participates in conflict, actively in conflict. The arts has always been a part of that in some regard. Um, but I think there's so much more to be, to be drawn out of because where you have an individual artist and, or you have an individual practicing art, there is, like I explained to you earlier, where you, ha you have their practice that they're looking maybe inwardly at their own experiences, their own traumas. Then you have another, maybe a larger circle where they start thinking about not so much what they went through, but what their peers went through, what particular conflict they were in, what was that about? And then I think um, what I'm really interested in and I think is, is foundational and valuable to our society is the, the broadest circle where they're, they're starting to speak not about their particular conflict, but about conflict in general. And then by extension, society in general and what are the decisions that are being made? How are they influencing foreign policy or the culture? Um, and by having those conversations, I think it really elevates it to something that is more accessible for the general public. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Something that I was uh, uh, taken by is your concept of veterans and your use of the word integration. And I think that there's this uh, concept that when you're talking about veterans, you're talking about veteran warriors all the time. And that might not be the case in terms of when you're trying to reintegrate into society as a veteran. So I was wondering if you guys could, could talk a little bit about that. Yeah, I, um, starting with at the National Veterans Art Museum right out of school, thinking now where I am four years later, I didn't, I didn't never think that I'd be working with the veteran community and also being accepted into it as much as I have. Um, but like really early on in those days, right, I was the language I didn't talk very much. I did not talk well about the work that I was seeing because I would call everyone a soldier, for example, right? When, you know, soldier refers to people that are in the army, right? And I didn't know all the branches. <laughs> I like couldn't, right? I didn't at basic level, right? Have the, the language to speak about uh, military service members or veterans. And, um, right, like meeting people I, I, you know, as making assumptions, right? Like, oh, so impacted by war experience, but like not everyone goes to war. Even in Vietnam, not everyone that was enlisted, commissioned, right, or drafted, whatever your case was, right, didn't get to choose their deployment to go to Vietnam or not, right? So you had um, Marines that were serving stateside, right, during Vietnam, that never got to go to Vietnam and have sort of, all, then these issues come up about like feeling like they didn't do anything because they didn't serve in combat. And like these, are, these only came up after engaging with the work and with the veteran community through the museum that I just never ever thought about as a, as a civilian, right? Because I just assumed, I was like, oh, you, were, you served during Vietnam? You're a Vietnam combat veteran, but it's not, not true, mm -hmm. yeah. And so not every, so when we think of post-traumatic syndrome, we tend to think, oh, someone's suffering from because they went to war and actually saw action, they're coming back and they need assistance in integrating themselves into society. That's not always the case, is it? No, I mean, you know, something that, that I realized is that, that, that trauma is unique to, to the individual. And you can't, something that the veterans uh, can do and like to do sometimes is compare like who's got it worse right in the military that that that's like par for the course like um, you know who's got it worse than the other person it's some 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 odd badge of honor to to suffer the most but I think when you get out you do realize that not all traumas are the same and and people's experiences are individual and it affect them mm -hmm. in particular ways mm -hmm. that that we may not understand or be able to relate to, but it, it doesn't lessen their, um, their particular experiences by any means. So uh, for me, my experience was pretty um, typical of what you think of as like a combat veteran. I was in the Marine Corps in the infantry in the 5th Marine Regiment out of Camp Pendleton in California. I went to Iraq in 2003 for the invasion uh, and was part of uh, 
the combat elements that were pushing into Iraq from the south uh, and eventually to Baghdad. So my experience was very, was very typical of what people think wartime is about. But many of my peers and friends um, have, have different experiences. And um, they, I really think, can lend some, some nuance to what it means to create art as mm -hmm. a veteran. Mm -hmm. So you had mentioned before that uh, in terms of, uh, of uh, veterans coming back to reintegrate into so society that uh, whether they saw combat or not, there's a certain um, there's a certain breakdown they have to go through to detoxify themselves from their experience uh, in some ways. And I wondered if you could elaborate on that. Yeah, um, maybe I could ask a question. Like, does anybody have a, a, an immediate or extended family member that has served in the military in any capacity here? Okay. Yeah. Almost, pretty much, almost everybody, right? Um, yeah pretty much almost everybody to, to some degree or another. Um, yeah, and, and so talking about reintegration, that's something that, that is interesting because it's, it's, um, it's frustrating, I think, sometimes. Um, because like what we had talked about was there are many people that, that have served and by extension their families have served or their families have been exposed to the effects and the consequences of going to war or serving in the military. And um, I think that if our, if our culture was, had some sort of, like I said before, like a guiding principle behind our society as a whole, um, it might be a little bit easier to, to work on reintegration. Um, but the challenges are, I think, steep to do that. Part of the reason why is because as a service member, the, the, the integration into the service in the first place is a transformation of identity. So like myself, I was 18 when I went to uh, what we call boot camp or basic training in the Marine Corps. And up to that point, my experience was as a child, a teenager in high school, that was it. So I was, when I was reaching these formative years as an adult, I was shaped and molded into what we would call a Marine. What does that mean? It's laden with culture, it's laden with symbolism and rites of passage. Um, and because that became my identity, not only that, but I was able to exercise that to its fullest capacity overseas in battle. Um, there was this distinguishing that happens from, from broader society. So when I got out of the military, integration was very difficult for me because it was like, you're part of something um, um, exceptional and unique. Mm -hmm. And it may not necessarily mean it's good all the time, but it is exceptional and it is very unique. And then when you leave that and you try and return to society, there's this question of like, what is my purpose? I'm not holding a weapon anymore. I'm not part of a unit of people that are operating in, in, in um, overseas. I'm not, I'm not, um, the, the sense of purpose is just not there. So what is, excuse me, what is needed is the ability to, um, to find a way to, to reintegrate oneself also as part of a community. And I think that that becomes the question then is, can we integrate into broader American society and what does that mean for us as veterans? So, um, Kind of related to that is uh, I'm going to bring up Veterans Day and sure. when someone returns from combat or returns from from serving uh, in the military, you know, there's a certain amount of patriotism that's involved with that. There's a certain amount of rah rah rah, we're proud of what you did, etc. And how that might relate to the actual veteran in terms of going into a conflict, serving their duties and responsibilities but having a certain uh, friction there in terms of how they feel about their actions and coming back and people saying, wow, we're so glad you went there and you know, kicked their ass, you know? <laughs> and you come back and you're like, well, that's... Sure, yeah, I think, and I do want to hear Moki's perspective also as a civilian, um, because yeah, I mean, as a veteran, yes, you do hear that from time to time. And, um, usually in November, of course, because it's Veterans Day. Um, so
So I think that we had talked about a pendulum swing from the Vietnam era where there was uh, the inability to distinguish the, the, the service member from the actual conflict and the, the politics that went behind that. And, and unfortunately, there was a, you know, it was, it was not a good time to be a veteran. And, and, and it was also during the draft where many people didn't have a choice to participate. They had to, you know, um, for, for whatever reason, they, they, they went along with it and, and uh, felt as though they didn't have a choice to do that necessarily. So there was this pendulum swing, I think, to, to now where it's, um, you know, sometimes we talk about like hero worship in a sense where it's just this, this concept of like this monolithic American veteran and, and because there's this veteran, it, that, that person stands for liberty and freedom and, um, and democracy. Um, but for, for the people that are enforcing the foreign policy decisions, there are so many gray areas and in, in ethical and moral nuances that, that we experience that sometimes getting a medal or, or receiving thanks is, is just, uh, it's trite because you don't feel good about everything that you did or you may have been able to do something better or something like that. So it's, yeah, that, that can be. So sometimes that, that's a conflict unto itself, can it, be. Yeah, I think so, because I'm so tired of using the word veteran, honestly, because it's like, <laughs> I just hear it all the time. Mm -hmm. We are people. We're, we're, mm -hmm. You know, there's much more to me as a person than, than my four years out of my mm -hmm. 36 years of life that, that I had overseas that I, that I was a Marine. Um, so yeah. similar to, <clears throat> so, you, so you're a person. You're a man first, and then one of the things that you are is a veteran. Similar to uh, in, the, uh, in the 90s, there was this rush to uh, support African-American artists, and then there came a point where African-American artists were saying, I'm not African-American first, I'm an artist first, and then African-American is part of my profile. And Moki, you had mentioned that it's really important to have intergenerational veterans involved in your program, which might mean someone from the Vietnam War, someone from uh, the conflict in Afghanistan. And so you're dealing with different kinds of perspectives in terms of veterans. And I, I wondered how that played out in some of your programs. Yeah, I th uh, on the note of, right, like, like, yeah, veteran is overused, right? I, there was, um, in that Lionhearted piece, there's a, it's one of the interviews this veteran said um, at the very end, you know, I want people to remember that I'm human, right? That like, I've gone through this experience and it is what it is, but the, I'm, I'm human at the end of it, right? And um, it's nice to see when I have programs, Vietnam veterans talking with contemporary veterans too, because even though I think we're, we're very good now at separating warrior from war, right? We can separate like you're doing your job versus like, you know, you had you made no difference to like stop whatever you're doing or whatever. Like within Vietnam, there's this this sentiment that like Vietnam veterans were not treated well when they came back, right? A lot of them. There's this term like well saying someone told me it's like say welcome home if you meet a Vietnam veteran because you don't know if they were ever told that when they came back. But then so like that word those words become sensitive, right? But then I, I meet a lot of contemporary veterans that when you say thank you for your service, that's that same sort of sensitivity where it's like <laughs> you're like polite about receiving the language maybe I don't know what your experience has been with people saying thank you for your service, but you know, we're, we're in Chicago, we're right by Great Lakes Naval Academy. And so there's regular graduations of naval, like, naval recruits and they'll be walking downtown and you know, people kind of get excited about that and they're like, thank you for your service. And they're like, just made it through boot camp, you know, haven't done very much. Let me buy you like a Denny's dinner. I and usually <laughs> say, uh, thank you for enjoying your freedom. Yeah. That's what I say generally yeah. because like, I think that that, one service may or may not actually have anything to do with preserving freedom, but the ability to exercise 
freedom and, and people capitalizing on their strengths as civilians mm -hmm. to me is just as important mm -hmm. as having a military to, um, in theory, preserve freedom. Yeah. yeah, and I think working at this museum for me has like really shocked me in being like, it's like taking ownership of my Americanism, right? Because I'm a daughter of immigrants, but I'm born here. I'm, I vote and I participate, right? And so like being in this museum has challenged my, like, like how do I practice my Americanism, right? And how do I take sort of ownership as a civilian, right? For what like the veteran community that takes this oath of enlistment too, right? Maybe for a lot of people it sounds a little cheesy, right? This like ba the patriotism that comes out of this rah rah military support, right? But it for me it changes like veterans I meet are I don't like more in tune, more authentic to the human the experience of humanity, whether it be from the experiences they have because they were in combat or because of the experience they as regular human beings, right, our social issues that come up are challenging, but then I, I really, what if you're um, a female combat vet, and you're dealing with like, and also brown, right, so you're dealing with racism and sexism as a regular human being, but then now you're also dealing with that being a combat veteran, right, so it's like amplified. So, like I'm constantly thinking about like, how can I do as a civilian to the capacity that I can to like support and understand and like be open to understanding and like let people, veterans know that I'm like, like I'm here to listen to you for whatever you want to say, whether it, I, you don't have to talk about your military experience, but we, we can talk about like that human, humanity connection, like human connection, right? So not all veterans obviously have the same kind of experience, no. have the same kind of post experience after serving in, in the military. Uh, I was wondering if you guys can talk a little bit about um, why these programs exist now. Yeah, why now? And that really is a question, like why should you care? Like why did you come to this panel? I don't know if that's me or not. Oh, is it? <laughs> yeah, like why? Why does it really matter? Um, and when I was in my, my darker days, uh, post-Iraq, pre-artist phase, <laughs> it was a, it really was a question of why. Like, why do people care? Why do they want to know what I went through or what my art means, you know? Why? Like, why should I tell them? That's another question, you know? So, why is it important? That, that, that's the crux of the issue. I think that, from my perspective, why it matters is, uh, most immediately, for the many of you that, that know individuals who have served in the military, these resources are available to them uh, free of charge and, and there are people just waiting to support those individuals. Or maybe, maybe your family members know another service member that could use them. So most immediately, these resources exist to serve the veterans in individual communities, to provide them with tools. In this case, it's arts instruction. It's learning how to think critically it's something that we talk about going from a warrior brain to an artist mind. So having a, a shift from how you relate to not only your own body and your own sense of creativity, but then also to your community as well. So um, that's really why Creative Vets exists is to do that. Um, for me as an artist and as an administrator and instructor, what I find most compelling is when veterans and service members go through the Creative Vets program, they are armed with tools, like I said, to, to be able to express themselves. But some of those artists may go on to, to think and to speak about broader social issues, um, like I had talked about before. Mm -hmm. So, and I think that the, the um, um, I think that uh, the standard for that was set uh, after World War I and World War II in particular, where you had um, hundreds of thousands of people in the United States that were associated with military service in some way, shape, or form, uh, particularly in World War II. And after that, there was, speaking of reintegration, there was a large push 
for the GI Bill, which was instrumental in getting a lot of veterans to go to college or to universities or to art schools, um, like uh, the, the School of the Art Institute, H.G. Westerman is a perfect example of that. He went to the Art Institute, he was in the Marine Corps, um, in the same battalion I was just 80 years prior to me. Wow. And so I found that, that his experience was something that could resonate with me. But he went on to make broader social commentary. Mm -hmm. And so if mm -hmm. creative vets can, can heal and provide tools to veterans, but then also have people go out and, and be able to, to identify and reintegrate into their communities, they can really help people think critically about why they vote, who they vote for, who's making the decisions and the policies. Mm -hmm. So from small to big, I think that is what creative is for. I, right, like why, why this next year? Like why a veteran art summit when, when the veteran artists are existing? But there's also, right, I, I asked Joe, I asked most veterans I work with, especially that are in our art practice, like do you call yourself a veteran artist? Because if you don't, I won't call you, I won't introduce you as a veteran artist, right? Because like artists first, because you can kind of pigeonhole yourself, right? If like if I'm gonna pigeonhole myself as like a, a black artist, right? Mm -hmm. Like and I mean I'm an artist period, right? I can sure. I can be general, right? And I I think about this when I go to other museums, especially the Art Institute, right? And I go around and see work and the, the Charles White retrospective that was up, Army Army Vet, right? And then the, the Ivan Albrecht that was up, Army Vet. And I was like, oh it's like something I'm looking at all the time because of the nature of which I'm working with veterans all the time. Um, but f when I give tours, for example, I always ask mostly young people, like, do you, who here know someone that is active duty, reservist, or is a veteran? And sometimes they'll have a lot of kids raise their hand, especially if they're coming from like Wisconsin and Indiana, more people know people that are more directly related as opposed to like grandparents. My grandfather was in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. I don't know anyone else. Or if I ask students that are coming from CPS schools, all of them raise, they're like, I'm, that's my plan, right? This is where I'm going. Um, and just seeing where the reach of like, who is touched by, right, the veteran community. Um, but like, th I think now, right, how long have we been in Afghanistan? 17 years. Yep, right? Yeah. Um, so the t students I'm giving tours for, I'm like, what year were you born? And a lot of them are like, like becoming like post 9-11 students, right? So they're like, I'm like, okay, now think about this. We've been in a war, in a declared war, your entire lives. Does it feel like it? And like, they're like, no, right? Um, I have a friend that served in, in, you know, in the Air Force in 2010 and got out. Um, and then his younger sister, eight years later, was deployed, oh, she's also she joined the Air Force, deployed in, in Kandahar in Afghanistan. And for him, he never thought eight years from his, his service that his younger sister would be there. He's like, I thought we would be done with this by this point. Um, but. I think that's an outworking of, um, and that's so frustrating for me. Like I wasn't in Afghanistan, I was in Iraq. Um, but, you know, we're on the cusp of the first inter, true intergenerational war in American history anyways. Mm -hmm. That's not exceptional for the rest of the world, unfortunately, but as far as the United States is concerned, this is the first. And um, which, which also means that there have been more Americans involved in conflict over the last 20 years than any other time in history. It's possible, possible. I mean, you know. So there are more veterans. Yeah, you could say that for sure. I mean. Yeah, I, I think so. And something we had talked about earlier was, um, and I keep on going back to this point because it's, it's my conviction, it's what I know, but it's, it's how we're able to maintain a war for 17 years in the, in the same country where you have uh, parents and, and, and children ending up fighting in the same conflict, decades apart, but, but still able to to have that reality, and a part of it may be the, pro the professionalization of the military, where um, we can maintain a standing military in, in operations overseas without having to pull th from the large group of, of people in the United States. Um, and uh, 
down, please. Thank you. <laughs> Four of my wonderful children. Um, please go sit down, okay? But, um, yeah, so it's like, you know, having, having a standing military that can do that, but then also um, not having a national buy-in to that, where they're feeling the pain, like in World War II, where they had to ration um, supplies and basic needs. Everyone chipped in to understand that this was a war effort, and so when they, they really felt what it meant yeah. to sacrifice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and because we have people that are willing to volunteer and serve in whatever capacity they choose in the military, it's very simple to sustain these conflicts. And so really I think where the crux of the issue becomes is how can these people, I think of us uh, as service members like myself, not only are we enforcers of, uh, of foreign policy, but we're also ambassadors at the same time. And many of us are, were very young when we did that. So you're working in this very unclear and nuanced role where you're representing the United States and our government, and by extension, the choices of our people. Um, you're representing it. And, and so the question then becomes, how can those people's experiences inform the rest of society, the, the, the society that they came from? So, um, mm -hmm. yeah, that's... Yeah, that is... It's, it's, Veteran resources exist, right? And there are veteran, veteran benefits. But I think also, right, from the civilian side, right, how can I be informed, like especially as a person that may, maybe, if, like I think about people that work at the VA, like be as informed as possible to understand that like these resources are also out there so I can like, if I'm gonna be the sort of funnel for a person to come up to me and be like, hey, do you know how I can do this thing? Like, I, I don't have everything, right, even though it's out there. So I have to do, like, a quick search, right? But, like, how do I um, stay informed and educated about, like, really what's out there? Because there's a lot, but it's not, like, compiled into one place, right? Or I think a lot of veterans don't really understand how to use their benefits at, at, at max, right? Or, like, because it's complicated sometimes, right, with administrative paperwork kind of stuff that happens. So, sure. right? <laughs> like, I... Um, uh, I, I meet people that, you know, even like older Vietnam veterans that go to the VA for the first time, mm -hmm. when they, they they have been always been able to when they're like 68. You're like, wow. And, and starting to, and go start doing therapy for the first time at sure. 68. Mm -hmm. So like so many people later in life and um, I don't know. I just wanted to check in with our audience to see if there were any questions that anyone had regarding uh, the, uh, the session or regarding what's been said so far. And you could ask anything you want. Uh, to me personally, I don't mind whatever you would like to know. Uh, could you hang on a second? There's a mic coming down to you. So I'm wondering if there are things that, um, Moki, that you do at the museum, um, like I'm thinking about, I guess, um, like content warnings or trigger warnings when you're dealing with um, like such a varied population of people who have all different kinds of experiences. I'm wondering like what you do at the museum with regards to that. And then um, I guess if there are things that you would like other arts presenters to be doing um, that could be helpful for like reaching um, veteran populations. Wonderful question. Someone asked me this yesterday too. Um, and so, being a licensed arts educator helps, and having professional development for trauma informed practice, which is just in general based good teaching practice. Um, I think being at the museum and because of the work that's there, and when people are there and they have these emotional connections to it or things come up. Um, if I, we set it up very much as a space in which, right, like let yourself be uncomfortable and be vulnerable because that's the work that's being presented is also sharing that, right? Um, and I haven't, I haven't had an experience where it sort of got to a certain extreme, right, because um, I think a big part of it is I never really ask questions from a veteran to like deeper whatever they want to share, like, because it's sort of touch and go with, like, maybe, it, like, I'm, for a lot of people, like, I've never talked about this, but, like, they'll start talking, and it's just, like, how can I show that I'm listening, right, and, like, really, like, being with that person, and less about being a veteran, but, like, how am I going to 
be with another human being in this sort of very intimate space and like just practicing that all the time, right? Like letting another person know that like, I'm here with you right now, like go as far as you want. Um, um, and this is nice because as we're doing this, um, I think thinking of engaging veterans, especially when you said ambassador, I was like, that's perfect because it's like, how do we give opportunities for veterans, especially like in employment, in educational spaces to be the people that can, that can share their human experiences, right? Because they, I think, adapt more to being able to like to have ex larger range of like experiences with, with especially young people. Um, mm -hmm. um, yeah. I think what you said is important, just being willing to, to listen. Yeah. Active listening, of course, active listening uh, is important. So I think for me in the past, uh, it, it was a matter of um, People may, they may not know what to ask or how or, or, or why even, um, but to me it was always frustrating when they asked but they didn't really want to hear or listen <laughs> to what I had to say sure, yeah. or enough. And yeah. I think that, so practicing active listening skills um, and, and being willing to just allow, allow for silence, allow mm -hmm. for, for space and, and um, and, and empathy is important. Yeah. yeah, I think that's important. I think like yeah, like the t I think it's time, right? Like allowing yourself the time. When I started working at the museum, I would like go home every day and kind of just cry, right? Because I like, didn't know how to like cope with like bearing someone's story, right? Or like being with the artwork that would like, I you know even still sometimes I'm like who, right? And it's become less because I can like separate myself a little bit from uh, but it's you know sh that, that shared human experience like I didn't know I don't know what you went through right and I won't understand I think as a civilian my I, I say this a lot to people as I've been working with the veteran community that as a civilian there's a wall in which I don't have military experience and I'm not planning on trying to have it either so there's a wall between you and me right but I want to be as close to that wall, maybe peeking over the wall as a civilian and like try to be as close to you as I can to understand what, what your experience is without crossing it. Um, I think that's, 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 that's vital for sure because the, the part of me that does have some optimism for, for uh, our society as a whole recognizes people like Moki or um, like Paul, or those of you here that may work with veterans or have family members that are veteran, veterans, you guys are like healers or facilitators. Mm -hmm. Like what you're doing is facilitating these these passages back into a community, mm -hmm. um, and that's the best way that I, I I think about it and and try and frame my own reintegration in that way is that I came from a place. I went away, and now I'm returning to a place. Excuse me, I'm sorry. Joshua, please sit down. Do not get up again. Do you understand? Someone might have to do some push-ups after this. Our next session is <laughs> going to be about parenting and That's uh, right, yeah. presenting, being uh, on a panel. Uh, there's another question back here. Hi, thank you all for this conversation. I've enjoyed it. I have a question maybe connected to what you're saying right now. I was thinking that there can be a disconnect between um, the way we um, value um, the people who go to war, right? And thank you for your service. And it's connected to patriotism and some of the highest values. And yet the ways we don't necessarily recognize that service afterward. Um, and so, um, to what extent do you see the kind of work you're doing through the arts as a mode of, of activism, of creating veterans who are also activists or advocates for their experience or for what we should be doing if we consider this a part of our society that some people will go to war? Thanks. Mm -hmm. So as far as Creative Vets is concerned, um, that's not in their wheelhouse necessarily. Like, at speaking, so I'll speak as an instructor first, and then as an individual and an artist second to answer that question. As an or as a as an instructor for creative vets, um, it, it's more focused on the individual veterans. We encourage all types of forms of, of 
uh, expression, and some of it is political, others of it is just about their, their individual experience. Um, so for that is to support the individual person first. Um, as an artist, as a veteran myself, um, I think it's a matter for me of, uh, I'll tell you my experience. I was really jaded when I came back from Iraq, like about the government, about why we went over there, about what we did there. I was just so jaded and didn't want to even think about it at all. Um, and that's a heavy burden to take emotionally, to, to have to think about these broader things. What did it mean for me to be part of this historic, massive event and everything that occurred after that? Like, what, what does that mean for me as a person? I'm just trying to take care of my children and my family mm -hmm. and pay the bills. That's it, <laughs> you know? And I don't have time to think about this. But what really, I think, pushed me into activism, like, and there are some artists that are like, that's their thing, is like mm -hmm. activism. And they're doing wonderful work in communities. We have a panel next month as well at uh, the ACAD conference at SAIC, where we'll talk uh, quite a bit about that thing. For me as an activist, um, it's weird to consider myself as such, but for me, my practice is about ownership of my body autonomy and, and self-determination of who I am as a person, not just as a veteran, but who Joseph is. Mm -hmm. The reason why is because the, what happens in the military, what happened to me was my body and my mind was weaponized. So to use my hands, they have this, this phrase in the Marine Corps, one mind, it's one mind, any weapon. Um, so it, it's more of the principle of who you are as a person, as a Marine and as a warrior. Your body and your mind is trained to do these things. Um, so for me, what I, what I find um, essential is, is bringing the knowledge of how people can understand their bodies. For me, it was performance. I do improvisational dance. I do performance both. And for me, it's the ability to, to claim, reclaim my body and to express that to other people. Mm -hmm. um, especially through the dance. I mean, because, you know, it's like I'm a big guy. I was in the Marine Corps. A lot of my buddies, you know, it's like uh, it's about as far from being in the infantry as you can get. <laughs> but for me, yeah. <laughs> it, it, it was who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. Mm -hmm. So for me, my activism is, is, I guess if you could say, it's more about soft power. It's more about reclaiming the individual, the body and the mind bringing those things into balance, mm -hmm. um, and, and then how to convey that to other people. Um, the one thing that has galvanized me to really think about how my experiences can give me a, a particular voice has been the latest developments with Saudi Arabia and the United States. For me, for some reason, that was like the last straw. So how our government has chosen to handle that relationship uh, over the last 80 or 90 years, for me, is just like, you know, it's... Uh, um, that, that's the one thing that finally pushed me into saying, okay, how can I educate other people and how can I have people, how can I, how can I maybe get people to listen to me about mm -hmm. this? Mm -hmm. If somebody doesn't say anything, if somebody who is in war, who participated in foreign policy decisions, if I can't stand up and say, this is why this is dysfunctional or this is why we need to change something, then who will do it? Mm -hmm. So for me, that's kind of what pushed me into thinking more seriously about that. Yeah. Any other questions? Uh, I have another question, actually, and the question is, uh, what are the challenges in the, that uh, you've had to deal with in terms of connecting the arts and using the arts as a tool with veterans to access different parts of what they may need to access to bring about either healing or a deeper understanding of their own experience, whether it's with their body or, or, or beyond that. So Joseph and I are both arts educators, right? You're like, yeah, yeah, sure, yeah. <laughs> um, and so we have this beautiful opportunity in which we get to be with a lot of different people and right, so like whatever our instruction is and whatever we are sharing and like whatever our curriculum is, has this like sort of really amazing power, right? Like art is very powerful, not only in making, but 
in looking and like being accessible to looking, right? So as a museum professional at an art museum that has very socially conscious work, right? It's a very, museums are always gonna be very activist spaces because of whatever we're exhibiting is never gonna be like one, one way or another, right? And if I'm talking about veteran voices, right? There's this huge spectrum of work that's there. It's not all this like, you know, it's not all like I had this like really traumatic experience, right? No, sometimes it's like super beautiful and it's about camaraderie and it's about human connection or it's about being with the, the civilian population of whatever country that we were fighting this war into and like getting that perspective or, um, but it's, I think a lot of the demographically, the people that come through the museum are number one, people that know veterans, military families, members, right? then veterans, and then these student tours I have, right, constantly that are either studying the Vietnam War, reading the things they carried, right, want to be in front of this artwork. But whatever I'm showing them and whatever I'm sharing as an educator in my tours, right, I have, to, I, I have this responsibility to be like, you have access to this looking. Just because you don't call yourself an artist or you've never drawn, I think a lot of people have this like, I can't go look at work because I don't get it, right? It was like, we're, we're inundated by visual culture. I was like, you like how something looks? Let's talk about it. I'll give you some language to talk about why you like looking at it. You don't have to understand it right away. I think that's a, a big, pe people that come through, they're like, I don't get it. So it's <laughs> like, about the process of yeah. art, not necessarily the final product of right. art making. Yeah, process of art, process of looking, like allowing yourself to look and question and not accept the work for as it is and start to like think about self related to the work, especially this work, right? Like where do you see yourself and your experiences or, or experiences of people that you know around you, whether they're civilians or veterans, right? In, in this work and that shared experience. I always talk, especially we're talking about people, like students come in, they ask me, they're like, so all these guys have like PTSD. I'm like, one, they're not all guys. <laughs> Two, right? You know, civilians, people can have PTS too, right? Does it, like, I love what you said about, like, we experience trauma in our, in our own ways, right? Um, at whatever level, like, all three of us could be in an experience that have very different views of it, right? And it's, it's showing up in the work. Um, I would say for my part, it's um, um, the partnership between the, the essay I see in Creative Vets is, is it's an example, it's the example, I think, of what could be possible uh, throughout the United States in general. Because what I see is the contemporary arts sphere, and I see the professional military sphere. And as different as they seem, they're very similar. There's particular language, as I'm learning as a student, <laughs> that that is laden with art terms. There's particular vernacular mm -hmm. that the military has. So you're taking two of the most exclusive and socially <laughs> active communities in the United States and you're bringing them together. Mm -hmm. That's what SASC and Creative Vets is doing in particular. But I think when you do that, there, there is potential that, that, that can be expounded on because of that. Because of how active the contemporary arts is in, in, in forming culture. And because the, the military is a reflection of culture, um, particularly probably middle to lower class America in general, that's what the military represents. Mm -hmm. So bringing together these two worlds um, under the context of art and culture and social action mm -hmm. has, I think, been, um, um, it's more than I ever thought yeah. I would ever get to experience myself. Yeah. That's great. I think we have another question here. Hi, it's sort of building off of Joseph's last question, but um, I was going to ask what you all saw. So we sort of established that uh, the potential for this work and this, that the integration of these two worlds um, is, is starting at least to take hold when you talk about healing and in kind of the public health um, space uh, and in terms of trauma and, and managing that. And I would just love to hear sort of what your hopes are for what's next. Like where's, the, where's sort of the next opportunity of the integration of, of the arts and the military? Like what would you sort of like to see 
programmatically um, or more sort of specifically in terms of what is what is the next level of integration of those two worlds sort of look like to you all? Do you have thoughts or would you like? Uh, you, you, yeah, it seems like you got, go. <laughs> You're like, I got thoughts. I'm aware of how much I can talk, so that's why I always make sure to ask. <laughs> Thank you. Um, for creative vets, it would be uh, expand, expanding programming and partnerships with other schools um, to, to capitalize on their faculty and their, their administrative teams that are doing wonderful work and, and bringing the, the, um, the myriad of, of, of veterans, young people that are, many, many people when they get out there are still in their early 20s. I think I was 21 when I got out and I had four years of service um, overseas as a team leader where I was in charge of four to 12 other young Marines as well. And, um, but you're still very young when you get out for the most part. So as Creative Ed is concerned, I think growing our footprint as an organization, partnering with these excellent institutions is probably the most important thing. Um, as an individual and an and, and artist and veteran, uh, I think for me, the next step is to be able to identify how culture is being informed by veteran artists' work, such as myself. My favorite example is Maurice Ravel, some of you may know, who was a composer. He was also in World War I, which I did not know until the last couple of years. And one of the, uh, um, um, one, a very important and poignant piece that he wrote was about someone who had passed away uh, on the battlefield that he knew personally. So when you look at people that excel in their particular disciplines, um, and, and the general, like, general public may know Maurice Ravel, or, or any of the other artists that, that have a background in the military. Um, that, I think, is the pinnacle of what it means to be a citizen and also someone who came back from war and w went on to, in, um, to inform their communities, for sure. So for me, that would, that would be it. I think seeing where it's going, um, being at the museum for four years, so like we do exhibition changes using Veterans Day, Memorial Day as Right, these sort of markers for like, let's, you know, or people are thinking about veteran community at that time anyway, so like, let's, let's, <laughs> let's just go for it anyway, right? So, um, but I've been able to see, right, like this, uh, there's postcards in the front, but this show that we have up right now, Original Warrior, right, to have a whole entire exhibition dedicated to Native American veteran artwork, right, like to talk about like this niche community, right, but within the larger context of veteran art, I mean, that's a powerful exhibition, right? So yeah. continuing to be, as, an, as, as a museum, as an institution that has this power to, like, what are you showing to the public, right? We're a free museum too, so it's like, how do we stay accessible, right? How do we um, make sure, pe like, the work that we're showing is having these conversations and, like, showing under mar uh, marginalized, within a marginalized group of people. Um, uh, their stories in that work. Um, like showing creative at work, not only just once, right, but like mm -hmm. a longer term in conjunction with like having several exhibitions at once. Um, right, having multiple perspectives on military experience. I, I, I have no idea what's gonna happen with this triennial show. I'm not sure what the work's gonna look like. Um, seeing, um, like this is Maurice Costello. He has a show opening in fall of next year, right, but seeing where as a Vietnam veteran artist, what he was making, like this first piece with the head was made in 1998, and the last one was made in 2006. Like, what is he making now in 2018 in response to everything that he's experienced, right? Um, yeah, I don't know, I mean, it's exciting, it's, it's different. It's, I, I feel like a little, like I'm in it, so I like, I wanna make, I, I, I would hope that it become like a little more mainstream for people to like think about artists or like go to the artist studio and, and like do what I do, which is like look at work and like wonder, like I wonder what this person's like background is. I wonder if they have military experience and I wonder if that's playing into this work in any way or like that's why they ended up making work that is more activist, right? Or m m trying to make like more bigger cultural social statements. Um, yeah, that especially. Yeah. Um, because it makes it accessible to, to everyone. Yeah. 
And, and I think that's what's, what I, I would hope will, will mature, yeah. is people like myself being able to make our experiences accessible to everyone. Because yeah. everyone has experienced trauma at some point in their lives. It may, you know, everyone's just experienced it in some point. Yeah. Um, and that's something we all have in common. Mm -hmm. So how to make my particular experiences um, broad or abstract enough to be able to, or foundational enough maybe, yeah. as far as how, to, how we may relate that to other people. So they get it. So when you hear a piece like Mar by Maurice Ravel, you can feel the emotion that was there. And it may speak to your particular experience, but it was informed by his experience in World War I. Yeah. Right. Uh, before we close, I just uh, wanted to see if you could uh, make any recommendations in terms of <clears throat> if people want to work with veterans, what kinds of resources might be out there, what kinds of first steps they might take to initiate uh, working with veterans or starting a program or reaching out to that community? I'll let you go first, please. I mean, it's, it's nice to be at the National Veterans Art Museum. We're like kind of a hub. People want to work with veterans and art, and so they kind of go to us first. So I've been, I've, I've, it's been nice because I, there are some people from ArtReach here too who've worked with, I know, right, who've worked with other veterans, but not with us too. But uh, there's, look within your community you know, even if you're outside of Chicago where there are a lot of resources, right? With even within small communities, right? I think about American Legions, VFW posts, or other like smaller like veteran organizations, like look them up, figure out who they are, and like meet each other. Um, I, I, as a civilian who, <laughs> right? I think it's important to meet, if you're gonna work with veterans, meet them where they are at, and less, and less do call out, like come to me, right? Sometimes you have to do that, that footwork and go out there and meet them, and um, for the most part, I'll be very, very receptive. <laughs> um, I've had really good experience with working with veterans just because they could, they see that I mean it, right? Because sure. I'm there. Sure. So the museum can be a connector and a resource for sure. people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, creative vets, of course, because um, we're always looking for people to go through the program. Uh, we want to help people, and the resources are available. So I, I think that most immediately that would be it. Broadly, um, that's something I'm still learning to navigate myself because uh, I just had my individual experience for the most part. And now just over the last two years, I'm getting more involved in, in um, resources and, and um, what is available to help other people. Yeah. So yeah, I'm new to it myself, honestly. But the Veterans Museum has been very helpful. That's so, great. Yeah. That's great. Well, Joseph and Moki, thank you. It's been thank really thank you. enlightening thank conversation. You. Thank you guys, Thanks too, for, for the question. Please. Yay. Um, cool. Yeah, I have, uh, if you're interested in visiting the museum, um, there are some brochures and postcards out on the front table. But so Joseph and I are going to stick around a little bit if you sure. have any more questions before we'll be the next there. session. Um, but really, thank you, everyone, for being here. and. Um, thank you for your authenticity as arts people to be participating in this conference. It's been really a whirlwind kind of excitement. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thanks.